In this video, we'll discuss the most popular types of managed funds that exist in the United States. I'll start off with a brief introduction of the investment companies we often think of when we discuss managed funds. Then I'll describe mutual funds in greater detail. After this, I'll discuss exchange traded funds and how their performance compares to that of mutual funds. And then after that, we'll discuss how we actually calculate mutual fund returns and where you can collect information about managed funds. One thing to keep in mind is that while I'll discuss several types of managed funds, there are several types of funds and fund companies that I won't be discussing in this video, but do exist, like pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Let's start our discussion of managed funds by discussing unit investment trusts. A unit investment trust is a pooled investment, meaning that a group of investors combine their capital and invest in the trust together. The trust then uses that capital to purchase assets and maintains that fixed portfolio of assets. The assets are usually relatively uniform. They might be all stocks or all bonds or a combination of stocks and bonds. For example, a unit investment trust might hold the 10 stocks with the largest market cap as of September 12, 2016. Once assets are placed in a unit investment trust, they don't change. In other words, we say that the trust is passively managed and the manager and the trustee don't remove or add any additional assets to the trust once it's created. Now, let's discuss the individuals involved in unit investment trusts. The first is the trustee. And the trustee puts together the trust deed, which specifies how the trust will be managed, what powers the trustee and the manager will have, and how unit holders can sell their shares. The trustee will also hire a manager to manage the portfolio. The trust manager determines which assets will be owned by the trust. And the unit holders are the individuals that own a portion of the trust. So you can think of them as similar to the shareholders of a stock. Unit holders can sell their units back to the fund when they want to liquidate their units. Finally, since the UIT owns assets whose value can fluctuate through time, the value of the units each unit holder owns fluctuates as well. That value is referred to as the net asset value or NAV. I'll discuss that more in a few minutes. The next managed fund we have is a little more interesting. It's the Real Estate Investment Trust, or REIT for short. These are closed-end investment companies that invest money in mortgages and various types of real estate investments. And when I say the fund is closed-end, what I mean is that once the shares are issued, uh, the fund won't issue any additional shares. As a REIT investor, if your REIT generates profit and pays a dividend, that dividend is also not taxed at the corporate or the dividend tax rate. Rather, you pay taxes on it as if it were ordinary income. Now, this is a big benefit for REIT investors since they don't face double taxation like they would if they had just invested in the stock of individual companies. So think of what happens when you invest in the stock of, say, Apple. The operating income of Apple is taxed once at the corporate tax rate, and then again, once it's distributed in the form of dividends, you get taxed at the dividend tax rate. Now, to balance that benefit, REITs are bound by several strict laws that govern what they can invest in and how they can distribute cash to investors. First, all REITs must have at least 100 shareholders, no five of whom can own more than 50% of the shares between them. Second, at least 75% of the REIT's assets have to be invested in real estate, cash, or U.S. treasuries. Finally, REITs must have a dividend payout ratio of greater than 90%. This means that if a REIT generates $10 million in profit during the year, it has to pay out at least 90% of that income, or $9 million, to its investors. Now, many malls in the U.S. are owned by REITs, as well as many apartment complexes. REITs often own property and receive rental income from the tenants. In fact, one of the largest REITs, the Simon Group, is based in Indianapolis. If you've ever eaten downtown in Indianapolis at Petichu, you've been in the Simon Property Group's lobby. The next type of managed fund company I'll discuss is a hedge fund. Hedge funds have a very broad definition. They're investment funds that pool capital from a limited number of accredited investors, invest that capital, and then offer a return to their investors. Now, I know that's vague, but that's because there are a lot of different funds that are defined as hedge funds. In general, hedge funds are structured as 
limited liability companies, or limited partnerships. They receive an initial investment from investors, and sometimes they'll borrow money in order to invest it. Now, unlike other funds I'll discuss in this video, there are very few restrictions on what hedge funds can invest in. They can buy stock, short stock, buy government debt, purchase debt that's been defaulted on, invest in futures, options, or swaps. They can even buy companies outright. In essence, hedge fund managers have extreme flexibility when deciding what to invest in. Hedge funds also have very few reporting requirements. They don't have to disclose their portfolio or their returns to the public. This is one reason why academics know relatively less about the hedge fund industry than the mutual fund industry. Now let's talk about how a fund manager makes money. A hedge fund manager makes money by charging an annual fee from his or her investors. Until recently, the most popular fee was called 2 and 20, where the fund manager received 2% of the assets under management, as well as 20% of the profits generated by the fund during the year. Recently, this fee has been significantly reduced as hedge funds are facing competition from passively managed funds. Finally, let's talk about who can invest in a hedge fund. To invest directly in a hedge fund, you have to be an accredited investor, meaning that you have to currently have a net worth of greater than a million dollars and or an annual income of $200,000 as an individual or $300,000 if you're filing your taxes jointly with your spouse. This restriction is in place primarily to prevent less wealthy investors from losing their life savings on hedge fund investment. As you might imagine, given the assets hedge funds can invest in, they're often much more risky than other managed funds I'll talk about in this video. Now, if you'd like an example of a hedge fund, I'd encourage you to take a look at either Two Sigma or AQR. These are two of the largest hedge funds, and they have very different investment strategies as noted by their fund prospectuses. Now that I've discussed the other managed fund types, let's talk about the managed fund type that I'll spend the most time on in this video, mutual funds. Now, mutual funds are pools of assets that are managed by an investment company. Investors buy shares of the mutual fund that increase or decrease in value based on the value of the portfolio managed by the mutual fund. There are many reasons why investors would want to invest in a mutual fund. First, they allow you to track how your portfolio's value has changed through time and how it performed relative to some benchmarks like other managed funds with a similar risk or the S&P 500 index. Next. Mutual funds allow you to diversify your portfolio. Rather than investing in, let's say, 10 individual stocks, you can invest in one mutual fund that manages a diversified portfolio of 50 stocks. This allows you to almost completely eliminate the firm-specific or diversifiable risk of your portfolio. The next benefit of mutual funds is that they're managed by a professional manager who's supported by researchers who determine whether specific securities or sectors are overvalued or undervalued. The fund manager receives regular reports from their analytical staff and invests or divests assets based on market conditions, expected returns, and fund needs. Finally, fund managers charge relatively low fees if we're comparing mutual funds to hedge funds or private equity funds. Historically, the fees for investing in mutual funds were a lot higher, but pressure from ETFs has dramatically reduced the annual fee, otherwise known as the expense ratio, for many mutual funds. In other words, for many mutual funds, you can pay a very low annual fee based on the amount that you invested for professional managers to manage your assets. Now let's talk about how you calculate the value of your investment in a mutual fund. This formula that you see is the formula for the net asset value, or NAV. The NAV represents the value of each share the mutual fund has issued to investors in exchange for their cash when they initially invested. Now, this NAV is calculated by summing up the total market value of the fund's portfolio, subtracting any liabilities that the fund owes in terms of labor or overhead, and then dividing by the number of shares the fund has issued to investors. So this NAV, if you want to think of it as something, you can think of it almost, almost like the, the intrinsic value of the mutual fund shares. It represents what those shares should be worth based on the fair value of the underlying assets in the mutual funds portfolio. Now that we know a little bit about the basics of mutual funds, let's talk about the two types of funds. 
The first are called closed-end funds, and these are funds that only issue a set number of shares when the fund is created by the fund family, hence the name closed-end funds. It's closed after it issues the initial funds. So if the fund issues 100 shares when it's created, you have to buy shares from another investor who owns those shares right now in order to buy into the fund. The fund itself doesn't issue any new shares after the fact. Now, since investors can only buy and sell shares from each other, shares of popular or very unpopular mutual funds can be bid up or down beyond or below the NAV. In other words, the price that you might pay for the shares of a closed-end fund might be above or below its net asset value, which represents the underlying market value of your investment. When a closed-end fund's share price is below the NAV, we say that it's being sold for a discount. When it's above the NAV, it's being sold for a premium. In most time periods, there's a closed-end fund discount. Now, let's see this historically. I pulled this chart from the Wall Street Journal a while back. It shows the price of closed-end funds relative to their NAV through time. Notice that most of the time, both the red and the blue lines are below zero. This indicates that there is a relatively consistent closed-end fund discount. Historically, it's been about 5 or 10% or so. However, notice that during recessionary periods like the financial crisis of 2008 through 2010, the discount on NAV increased significantly. In other words, investors were willing to sell their closed-end fund shares for a 30-something percent discount on the fair market value of those shares. The primary explanation of this closed-end fund discount is liquidity risk. Investors fear that they won't be able to pull their money out without taking a huge loss if the asset values continue to decline further. So during periods of economic distress, investors that own shares want to sell their shares for a discount. Now notice during some periods, closed-end funds can trade for a premium. So for example, right here, right here, and right here. One of the reasons for this is because investors might believe that some closed-end fund managers actually have skill. They therefore want to benefit from that skill by buying up the shares the manager is managing, and when they want to do that, that pushes the share price of those closed-end funds above that fund's NAV. All right, so enough about closed-end funds. Let's talk now about open-end mutual funds. Now, these are what most people think of when they think of mutual funds. If you've ever thought of buying a Vanguard mutual fund, chances are it was an open-end mutual fund. The primary difference between open-end mutual funds and the closed-end funds that I just showed you is that open-end funds allow investors to buy and sell shares directly from the fund. When an investor buys shares of the mutual fund, the mutual fund takes that capital and increases its holdings of the assets already in the portfolio. One of the benefits of open-end mutual funds is that they're priced at the NAV. Since investors buy and sell from the fund, there's no liquidity issue. As investors cash out, the fund sells assets in its portfolio and pays investors the NAV multiplied by the number of fund shares they sold minus any fees. Now let's take a look at one of these funds in the real world. This would also be a pretty good opportunity for me to show you what other data exists for a mutual fund. All right, so I'm on Morningstar's website, and I decided to take a look at the American Funds American Mutual A, or the AMRMX. And we have a host of information about this fund provided by Morningstar. If you're looking for an outside resource that's not Bloomberg or the fund's prospectus, Morningstar is probably one of the best sources. So we have its one-day return, negative 2.47%. Uh, so that's just the change in the NAV. Total assets, this is total assets under management, about $50.9 billion. And it's adjusted expense ratio, and it's expense ratio. These, well, really this. This is the annual expenses that the fund charges to investors. So if the fund has $50.9 billion in assets under management, it's charging investors 0.61% of that assets under management every year for the privilege of this manager's expertise. 
So let's take a look at some other stuff. So here's a chart of the fund's performance through time. Obviously, uh, it's done quite well through time up until recently. And we can also look at its performance both by itself and then also relative to its own category and some index that it's comparing itself to. Also up here near the top, the fund's category is defined. So this fund is a large value fund. In other words, it invests primarily in large market cap stocks and then also stocks that have that are considered value stocks as opposed to growth stocks. Under the fund analysis tab, we have some perspectives from one senior analyst who has taken a look at this fund and this individual has given an opinion of the fund. Under performance, we have the fund's performance through time. Very similar to what we saw earlier, we can see the fund's 10-year and its 15-year performance, its performance relative to its category of mutual funds that it's competing against, and then its performance relative to the benchmark index. The fund's risk is also available here, so its risk versus its, versus its own category is pretty high, so relative to other large cap value mutual funds, this fund has a, a higher likely beta or volatility than the other the other funds in its portfolio. Uh, we can also see its alpha. If you remember our cap M discussion, this is the cap M alpha, it's beta, it's R squared relative to the uh, S and P 500 index is going to be right over here. And we also have its sharp ratio. Now the last tab I'll show you is the portfolio tab. Actually, I'll show you one more tab. Uh, but if we want to get a sense of what the assets are in this fund's portfolio, they're here. As of the time that I'm recording this video, 75% of the fund's assets are in U.S. equity. 12% are in non-U.S. equity, so that might be equity of, let's say, Japanese companies or European companies. We have 1% of the assets or of the fund's assets under management in fixed income, about 11% in cash. And if we go down here, we can also get a sense of the average P.E. ratio, price to sales ratio, etc. And then we can also see the industries that this mutual fund has invested in. So here's the, the basic sectors. So this fund has invested, I should say, it's overweighted its investments in the healthcare industry. It's relatively underinvested or underweighted in cyclical industries like the basic materials industry and real estate. All right, last but not least, we have some information on the fund managers. So our management team for this fund is these individuals, and we can get a sense of how much they've invested in the fund, how long they've been with the fund, and also the number of managers, their average tenure, and if we want to, we should be able to find out some additional information about some of the other managers of the fund. If we want to, we can often zoom in on one of these managers, so if I click on Joyce E. Gordon, you can get a sense of her background. So what's her career been like? Does she have an MBA? Does she have a CFA? So she has an MBA here, but she doesn't have a CFA as far as I can tell. All right, let's get back to the lecture. Now that you know what an open-ed mutual fund is, let's talk about how they're marketed and sold. First, a mutual fund family like Vanguard or Guggenheim might advertise on TV or in the Wall Street Journal via direct marketing. In other words, the fund family might advertise their fund's performance to potential investors to convince them to invest money in one of the funds in the family. The next way funds might sell their shares is through Salesforce marketing. There are several ways this is done. For example, a fund might maintain a sales force whose job it is to meet with groups of high net worth investors and convince them to invest in the mutual fund. This is very commonly done to attract investment from organizations that offer 401k plans to their employees. The fund or the fund family will meet with representatives of the company and convince them to invest money in one or more of the family's funds. In the real world, 
there are many conflicts of interest with this process. Salespeople who work for the fund might try to bribe the representatives of the firm that's determining where to invest money in order to encourage them to vote in favor of this fund or fund family. They might offer free tickets or free vacations or some other form of compensation. Now, the reason the salespeople do this is because they might be compensated based on the assets that they bring in to the fund. So obviously there's a potential conflict of interest. Now, the final popular way that mutual funds are marketed and sold is through financial intermediaries like commercial banks or personal financial planning firms. If you're meeting with a financial advisor, that advisor might recommend that you invest in a particular mutual fund because its objectives match yours and its historical performance has been pretty good. But just be aware that at some financial planning firms and other financial intermediaries, the individual selling you the fund might be compensated based on whether they're able to convince you to invest, which again leads to conflicts of interest. So to sum up, there are many ways that mutual funds are advertised and sold, but the most important thing to remember is that many of the individual selling investors on a mutual fund receive compensation based on whether they're able to convince investors to invest in that fund, not on whether they made a good recommendation to the investor. So always ask how a salesperson is being compensated before you invest in shares of a mutual fund. All right. Let's take a look at an example to reinforce some of what we just covered. So this is just a standard CFA question. A student from the audience asked you to explain the differences between open-end and closed-end mutual funds. Which of the following will least likely be included in your explanation? A. Shares in closed-end funds can be bought and sold anytime during the trading day. B. Open-end funds are more likely to trade at a discount to NAV, while closed-end funds generally trade close to the NAV, or C, when selling shares, investors in open-end funds sell the shares back to the fund, whereas investors in the closed-end fund sell the shares back to others in the secondary market. Well, we did take a look at closed-end funds and open-end funds, so you should know that closed-end funds are more likely to be traded at a discount, and for that reason, the answer here would actually be B. Answers A and C are both true. So closed end funds, I'll mention it again later in this video, but closed end funds are traded very much like stocks. You can buy and sell them during the trading day. And for that answer choice C, when you're selling shares as an investor in an open-ended mutual fund, you can sell your shares directly back to the mutual fund. So answer choice B is the only thing that is not true here. Now it's time to discuss fee structures of mutual funds. Every mutual fund is going to have a different fee structure. However, I've listed some of the most common fees here. The fee that every mutual fund investor pays is for operating expenses. This is the fee that covers the salaries of the manager and the researchers, the overhead costs for offices, and any data and tools the fund needs. The next fee you might see is the front end load. This is the fee you pay as soon as you invest. It's a percentage of the value you invest. The back end load or redemption fee is the percentage of the value you're withdrawing from the fund that gets paid to the fund. In other words, it's the charge for you pulling your money out. This fee is often used to prevent investors from pulling their money out a little too quickly. Finally, we have the 12B1 fee. And this is the fee that you pay to cover the advertising expenses of the mutual fund. In other words, it's the fee that covers the salespeople the mutual fund has hired to sell new shares of the mutual fund. All of these fees are going to be disclosed in the fund's prospectus. Now, let's take a look at the fees of the Fidelity fund that I just showed you. Okay, so I've just clicked the hyperlink from our PowerPoint slide. And over here on Fidelity's website, we can access the prospectus of this mutual fund. Now the prospectus, as I said in one of our very early lectures, is kind of your roadmap. It's, it's the document that tells investors everything they need to know in order to feel comfortable investing in a, a mutual fund. So I will focus primarily on the summary prospectus. So if I scroll down here, you'll get some information about the fund its investment objective, and then one of the very first things you'll always see are the fees. So here's our management fee of 
about 1.5 basis points. And then we have a distribution fee and other expenses. And that totals about 0.015%. So the fees here are incredibly low. All right, now let's take a look at how we actually calculate the return on a mutual fund once we know the fund's fees. So this formula that you're looking at, it really just tells us if we invest a certain amount, aka the present value or PV, how much will we have at the end of the investment period or our future value? Now, we need to know our return, which is R, and that's the annual return over the investment period. T is the number of years that we're investing for. X is our expense ratio, so it's that number that we saw when we looked on Morningstar. And then these others, 1 minus B, this is going to be our front end load. This is what we use to account for that front end load that you pay as soon as you invest in the mutual fund. We're just going to multiply our present value by 1 minus the front end load, and that accounts for the front end load. For the expense ratio, since we're paying that every year, that's the reason why we multiply by 1 minus x to the power of t. We're paying it for t years. And then finally, our redemption, or our close, our back end load, is calculated or taken into consideration by just taking 1 minus the back end load. Since we only pay that when we liquidate our assets from the mutual fund, we're only paying that one time, so we're just taking 1 minus c, which is our indicator for the back end load. Now it's time to take a look at an example. So in this example, we have three classes of shares offered by a mutual fund, class A, class B, and class C. And they all have a different front end back load and management fees and a total expense ratio. So if we know that we have invested $10,000 in each of these fund classes and we're investing for five years and assuming an 8% return, how much are we going to have at the end of the investment period, at the end of five years? Well, to work this problem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that formula from a few seconds ago, and I'm going to move over to Excel since this makes it much easier to work the problem. So I'm over here in Excel in our Chapter 12 example spreadsheet, and let's go ahead and calculate the value or the future value of any funds or $10,000 invested in the Class A shares, let's say in one year. So first things first, we need to take our initial investment of $10,000, multiply that by 1 minus our front end load, and then we're going to multiply that by 1 plus our return, which in this example was expected to be 8% annually. And since we are investing for a certain number of years, in this case one, I'm going to link that to cell C14. Next, we need to take into consideration our expense ratio, our annual expense ratio. Now, our expense ratio is just 0.25% or 25 basis points, so I'm going to take into account 1 minus that, um, that value and take that to the, well, first. And finally, if we have any back-end load, that's going to be taken into consideration at the very end, so 1 minus our back-end load. Now, before I go any further, I am going to link several of these, or uh, hard code some of these different variables so I can copy the formula across. So, so D5, I want to put a dollar sign in front of the 5. Same thing for the D10. And also for the D6. So they'll copy across as I drag this across. And next, I want to put a dollar sign in front of these year variables. And that should do it. All right, so if we invested $10,000 in the Class A mutual fund shares, at the end of year one, if we pulled our money out, we'd have $10,557. Now, if we invest for a longer period of time, we should end up with about $43,445. And 
just to complete the process, I will copy this across and down. All right, so if we've done this correctly, we can get a sense of, given the same expected return, how big a difference the fees actually play in the, the future value of our investment. So I'll move over back into our PowerPoint slide now. We just saw how to calculate the future value of a mutual fund investment based on a certain return and certain fees and an investment period. Notice here the difference that the fees actually make. So the Class A and Class C shares, they have a pretty similar future value, but the Class B shares, the expense ratio for Class B shares is 2%. It's much higher than the expense ratio of Class A or Class C, and that's this expense ratio of 2%, you're paying this every year. So this is really why fees are so damaging to investors when they invest in mutual funds. If you're investing in a fund with a very high fee, it's going to dramatically eat up any possible return that you might have gained. I mean, you're losing here. I mean, you have an op opportunity cost of potentially fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. So it's a big deal, the fees. So you always want to identify mutual funds that have the lowest fees possible. Now, there are a lot of mutual funds out there. If you have a long-term investment objective and you want to focus on a certain asset class, there's almost certainly a mutual fund that matches those needs. There are funds that focus on common stocks, preferred stocks, bonds, and even other mutual funds. You can hold funds of funds, literally. So some funds focus on geographic areas, while some funds will focus on different sectors or industries. Finally, some mutual funds will hold securities in several asset classes, like stocks and bonds. When we look at mutual fund performance, we often want to compare a mutual fund to other funds that have a similar investment objective and are holding similar assets. Speaking of investment objectives, I do need to discuss what's in the prospectus. Now, as I said all the way back in one of our very first lectures, the prospectus is the roadmap for a managed fund. It tells an investor everything they need to know about a fund, so it's important to know what goes into that prospectus. So let's take a look at that prospectus that we had for Fidelity, the Fidelity Fund, in a little more detail. So here's our Fidelity Fund's prospectus, and like most prospectuses, we have some beginning information, and then it's it's broken down into several categories. So the objective is always going to be near the top of the document. So this fund that we've been talking about seeks to provide investment results that correspond to the total return. So in terms of return, what the fund manager is focused on is capital, capital accumulation and dividend income. And it's attempting to outperform other common stocks publicly traded in the US. Uh, the strategies are going to be listed usually right after the objective, and this is actually how the fund achieves its objective. We also have a sense of what security types the fund is going to be investing in, so equity securities, as opposed to, let's say, mutual funds or treasury securities, etc. And in any prospectus, you're also going to be given a list of the, the most important risks of investing in this fund. So stock market volatility, obviously a big concern, correlations to the index, passive management risk, securities lending risk. Uh, there are all kinds of other risks, interest rate risks that might not be mentioned here, but it's a significant concern. And then down here, we'll have some additional information on the fund management. So here's a blurb about who is managing the fund, how much they're being paid, etc., who our advisor for this fund is, and where the manager is located. In this case, there are many managers. Given the size of this mutual fund, it's not out of the question, and we have a background on each of them. Now, before I move on and talk about ETFs, there are a couple of final points you should know about mutual funds that I didn't really have a good way to slip in earlier, but you should know. First off, most mutual funds, as a general rule, when they're creating their prospectus and initially selling their shares, they'll often limit the amount that they can invest in any one security to 5% of the total portfolio. 
So this means mutual fund managers can't overweight their secure their portfolio in any one security like Apple or Amazon. Now, next thing you should know is that most mutual funds are not allowed to short securities. Uh, they can't short stocks. They can't uh, do anything like that. So that's that's just one of the well recognized rules when it comes to mutual funds. Also, most mu mutual funds are actively managed. We have a couple of different ratios and measures that will determine how actively managed a, a mutual fund is. There's something called active share that you can look at, but usually mutual funds are going to be actively managed because, quite frankly, they have to justify why they have higher fees than ETFs. And then finally, you should know that, as I, I guess I mentioned already, closed-end funds trade like stocks on the market. So you can buy and sell shares of closed-end funds just as you would, say, shares of Apple as, as the market is open. Unlike closed-end funds, however, open-end funds are typically redeemed and they, they sell their shares based on the NAV at the end of the trading day. So the NAV of a particular open-end mutual fund might go up or down during the trading day, but at the end of the trading day, whatever the closing NAV is, that's the NAV that if you wanted to buy shares of that mutual fund that day, that's going to be the price that you pay per mutual fund share. Now it's time to talk about one of the primary competitors to mutual funds, exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, as they're more commonly known. Now, ETFs are almost identical to mutual funds, except that they're traded more like stocks, and typically they have lower fees. So unlike mutual funds, ETFs are primarily passively managed. This means that the manager isn't trying to identify undervalued or overvalued securities to buy or sell, and ETFs often track some index or some basket of securities. For example, the largest ETF in the world based on assets under management is the S&P 500 ETF, which tracks the S&P 500 index. The only time a security is added to this ETF is when the security is also added to the S&P 500 index. Because ETFs are passively managed, they spend far less time on research, and they also spend far less money. This means that their fees don't need to be as high, and this is why ETFs charge lower fees. For example, as of the time that I'm recording this video, the expense ratio on the S&P 500 ETF was 9.5 basis points. The low fees are one reason why the ETFs are so competitive relative to mutual funds. Now, there are other benefits of ETFs. First, because they trade like stocks on the market, they can be sold short or bought on margin. You can buy and sell them both during trading hours and then also in the aftermarket and pre-market periods if your broker allows it. There are, however, some drawbacks to ETFs. First, unlike open-end mutual funds that are bought and sold from the fund at NAV, ETFs are traded on an exchange and can be bid above or below the fund's NAV. Typically, this deviation is pretty small, so it's usually not that much of a concern. Now, the second slight disadvantage is that you have to buy an ETF via a broker like E-Trade or TD Ameritrade versus mutual funds or open-end mutual funds where you typically buy them from the fund itself. Recently, this hasn't been such a big concern since brokerage fees have been significantly reduced. In fact, some brokers don't even charge fees for buying and selling ETFs anymore. Now, let's take a look at the number of investment companies by type through time. Notice that while the total number of managed funds has decreased through time, much of that decline has been due to UITs, or Unit Investment Trusts. Mutual funds and ETFs have both grown in popularity, though the growth of ETFs has been much greater in percentage terms. If we were to take a look at assets under management through time, we can see that mutual funds manage the majority of investor capital, although in recent years, ETFs have increased their share of the investment pie. So let's talk about why that is. This is a table that I copied from a paper by Eugene Fama and Ken French that was published in 2008. It shows the historical performance of mutual funds. The authors sort mutual funds based upon their gross returns over the past 60 months and place each mutual fund into one of 10 portfolios. The future performance of those mutual funds that perform the worst over the past 60 months is reported here in this top part. While the future performance of mutual funds that perform the best over the past 60 months is reported down here. 
the authors report the monthly alphas over the next three years. Now, notice that for the funds that perform the worst, their alphas are only very weakly statistically significant significantly negative, indicating that there's very weak evidence that funds that performed poorly historically continue to underperform the market. And the only statistical significance we see is actually in the next 12 months after the portfolios are formed. For the funds that historically outperform the market or perform the best, there's also very weak evidence that they continue to outperform the market. It's only in that first year after the portfolios are formed that these firms outperform the market. What this evidence indicates is that there is very, very weak evidence that past performance of a mutual fund predicts future performance. Funds that outperformed historically don't necessarily continue to outperform in the future. Now, let's take a look at what happens when we sort based on the returns net of fees. In this table, Fama and French repeat the procedure, only this time they take into account fees. In other words, they sort mutual funds into 10 portfolios based on the returns they offered shareholders after the fees were taken out. Notice that once you sort funds into portfolios based on returns net of fees, the monthly alphas are not statistically significant over any period longer than a month after the portfolios are formed. This indicates that once you take into account fees, the monthly alphas of outperformers are insignificantly different from those of mutual funds with similar risk level. Now, the implication of these two tables, as well as other corroborating evidence in this area, is that mutual fund managers do not appear to be able to outperform the market over any significant amount of time. So, why should investors invest their money in a mutual fund that has a higher expense ratio than a comparable ETF? The fact that mutual funds don't appear to outperform the market has caused many investors, including myself, to primarily invest in ETFs rather than mutual funds. Now, you've probably heard mutual funds mention that their past performance is very good, maybe in TV advertisements. So let me address that for a second. You might have heard that, let's say, 75% of our funds beat their three-year LIPR average. Now, this may be true, for some funds or some fund fam families, but mutual funds as a whole have underperformed the Wilshire 5000 index for 25 of the last 41 years, or the 25 of the 41 years from 1971 to 2011, after you consider fees. So why do we continue to hear the phrase, X percent of our funds beat their three-year LIPR average? Well, it's because there are many ways that fund families can manipulate the number of mutual funds they actually manage. Poorly performing mutual funds are often liquidated, and those funds are placed in another fund in the family that did outperform its three-year LIPR average. So, for example, if a fund family has 10 mutual funds, and 5 outperformed and 5 underperformed their LIPR average, the fund family could close the 5 underperforming funds and move those funds into outperforming funds and then claim that 100% of their active funds beat their 3-year LIPR average. The choice of the benchmark is also often left to the discretion of the fund manager. Now, I do have a couple of final explanations for why mutual funds underperform the market. First, many mutual funds are prevented from investing more than 5% of the portfolio's assets in any one security. I guess I already mentioned that earlier. What this means is that the fund manager can't significantly overweight the security in the any security in the portfolio that they have a strong belief is undervalued. In other words, if I'm managing a portfolio and I think that Amazon is undervalued and it has an implied alpha of 40% over the next year, I can only put 5% at most of my portfolio's funds in Amazon. So this is one of the reasons why mutual funds are often, con often seen as potentially unable to outperform the market. Now that you know a little about mutual funds and ETFs, let's talk about how the return on a mutual fund is calculated. Essentially, we use the holding period return formula, but we also include any capital gains distributions in the calculation. So here we have our NAV, so the NAV at the end of the period, or time period 1, minus the NAV at the beginning of the period, let's call that time period 0, plus any income received, this would be dividends paid out by the sh 
stocks that the mutual fund has owned, or maybe if the fund owns some bonds, these might be coupon payments. And these capital gains distributions, what these are, are any capital gains that are realized when the fund sells a stock that it owns for, for a capital gain. So f for example, let's say the fund I'm managing sold Amazon shares for a capital gain of 10%. That capital gain distribution is going to be recognized right here. And we're going to divide all of this by the original NAV, the NAV at the beginning of the period. So let's take a look at an example. The initial NAV of this fund is $20. And so that's the, the NAV of the open-end mutual fund when you bought shares. And this fund had income distributions of $0.15, cents, so that's probably in the form of dividends, and capital gains distributions of $0.05, cents, so it probably liquidated some of its shares in its portfolio, and that's the capital gains on those shares. And then its ending NAV is $20.10. Now, the return on that mutual fund is going to be just that ending NAV of $20.10 minus the starting NAV plus all of the cash that's been received by the fund. So the income, so the dividends, and then the, the capital gains. And so once you scale that by the starting NAV, that's going to give you a return of 1.5%. Last but not least, let's talk about where you can find information about mutual funds. Now, I've already shown you a prospectus. You can pull any mutual fund prospectus, both from the fund's website and also from the Edgar database, the, the database that I've mentioned many times that is put out by the SEC. A fund will also issue a statement of additional information and an annual report, which details past performance and any updated information on the fund. Now, if you want to use outside sources, Yahoo Finance can provide some basic information on mutual funds. However, the most helpful outside resources on mutual funds are going to be the Bloomberg Terminal and Morningstar. So let's summarize some of the more important points I mentioned in this video. First, some managed fund types are actively managed while others are passively managed. We saw that Unit investment trusts and ETFs are passively managed, whereas hedge funds in particular are actively managed. Mutual funds are primarily actively managed, but the scale of their active management depends on the fund manager. Next, I did talk about hedge funds and how they had much more flexibility in what they invest in than mutual funds. So they don't have to only invest in, let's say, bonds or stocks. They can also invest in options or futures or forwards. So they have unlimited ways that they can invest. And any asset class that exists, usually a hedge fund can invest in it. Next, different funds will have different objectives. Any fund, when they put out their prospectus, is going to specify their objectives in that prospectus, first thing. And so if you're identifying which fund to invest in, you need to look at their objectives straight away. That's one of the most important things that you should be looking at when you're investing in a mutual fund. Now, finally, I showed you the evidence or some limited amount of the evidence, but mutual funds historically have not fa been found to outperform the market, particularly after you take into account their fees. I realize that's not exactly a controversial statement, but it is something that is hotly debated in the industry and academia right now. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions about mutual funds or ETFs or any of the calculations I did today, please feel free to email me or call me. Uh, I am available as needed. So thank you very much, and I'll see you on the next video.